Today, we're going to talk about blockchain. But before we do that, we're going to talk about something else, about something related. This thing is called disruptive technologies. Disruptive technologies are technologies that aim to disrupt whole industries, whole markets, and change the world. That might sound big, that might sound exaggerated, but there is a plenty of those that you know. One example could be a smartphone. Smartphone was a technology that disrupted mobile phone market. Another example could be a digital camera. Digital camera transformed the personal camera market. Now, there is something very interesting about disruptive technologies. Initially, when they are introduced to the market, when they are introduced to the consumer market, they don't make a lot of sense. They start with very poor performance, like digital camera would, would have very low resolution. In fact, the number of megapixels was so low that I remember back in the days when it was introduced, if you make a photo and you put it on old CRT display, you still could barely see what was in the picture. So initially, those technologies don't spark a lot of enthusiasm from the consumers. But as technology progress, they cross the magic li line that symbolizes that it's becoming attractive for the cons cost customers. And, and I have noticed that uh, as digital cameras who would have more and more megapixels, more and more of my friends would buy digital cameras to make photos from their holidays. And in fact, they progress so much that today digital cameras, nobody cares anymore. 10 megapixels, 20 megapixels, doesn't matter anymore because they are way too good. And in fact, nobody is buying digital cameras to make photos from holidays anymore because, well, we have one in our mobile phone or we have a bunch of them in our mobile phones. And I think it's extremely important when talking about blockchain today is noticing that blockchain is a disruptive technology in very early days, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to many markets yet. But it doesn't mean it's going to be like that in the future. So blockchain. It all started with Bitcoin. And you probably heard, some of you at least, heard about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency, the first internet currency distributed with no central authority. There is no person. There is no group of people, there is no institution, there is no server controlling running Bitcoin. And yet, there are some rules that are enforced. For example, I cannot spend money that I don't have. Or I cannot spend my money twice. Nobody can just print extra Bitcoins. It's just impossible. And the way it happens is there is some magic behind it. There is a little bit of cryptography, in fact. There is a little bit of mathematics, there is a little bit of networking, and a little bit of economy. And it is all put together in a way that power is distributed among all the users of the system. Now, we can talk about complex technologies, or we can focus about on building something simpler that we can all understand. Easy way to think about Bitcoin is, well, it's just a huge spreadsheet that is shared among all the users of Bitcoin, and every row in the spreadsheet is just one transaction, and we have columns from, to, an amount, and basically, this pressure represents the history of all the transactions that ever happened. Well, in reality, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more complex. Well, the people are represented by the public keys or addresses. You can think about it as your uh, distributed internet bank account number. But that's the idea for Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is not the end. It's not the, the blockchain. It's just the beginning. And the next chapter for cryptocurrencies and the next chapter for blockchain is programmable blockchain with Ethereum being the first one. And how does Ethereum work? Well, it's a very similar idea to Bitcoin. We still have three columns, from, to, and data. We still can think about it as a giant spreadsheet that we share. We still have transactions. But now the third column can be more generalized column. It might represent a value that I transfer but something different, something new might happen as well. And this new thing is I can write a piece of computer code, a piece of software. It's called smart contract. And I can send transaction to the network and it's gonna be deployed and the code gonna stay in the blockchain. Now, once I have the code in the blockchain, I can send transactions, not only from a person to a person, but I can send a transaction from a person to a smart contract or I can send 
transaction can be sent from smart contract to a person. Even a smart contract can send a transaction to a different smart contract. And execution of the code in the smart contract can be triggered by a user. Okay, that sounds like a weird piece of technology. Why would you care? Well, let's imagine. So Natalia is here with us today. Natalia is my wife. She's gonna be my volunteer. Huge applause for Natalia for being my volunteer. Thank you. She get more applause than I did. Huh? So uh, we deploy a smart contract to a blockchain. And I sent a little bit of ether, a little bit of money to the smart contract. And Natalia sends a little bit of money to the smart contract. And then smart contract is right in a way it introduces new rules. And the rules are one of us is picked at random and all the money is transferred to that person, either me or Natalia. Well, it doesn't sound big, but what just happened? We built a lottery on the blockchain. We can easily generalize it and say anyone in this room can take part in the lottery, or we can easily generalize and say anyone in the world can take part in the lottery. But there is no person or group of people or institution controlling the lottery. There is no server running the lottery, yet if the code is fine, if the code is fair, there is no way to cheat the lottery. Let's make another example. How about we do a following smart contract? Everybody here in this room, we chip in a little bit. We pay a small amount of money to the smart contract. And then if one of us has a fire in his apartment, the money can be withdrawn so the apartment can be renovated. What just happened? We built an insurance company on the blockchain. Now, there is no controlling authority, no person, no group of people, no institute. There might be even no institution whatsoever. Uh, there is no server running. And yet, if the code is all right, it's going to work just fine. Now, there is a bunch of questions. How do we know how everyone should chip in? How, how do we know how much to withdraw? And finally, one of the most important ones, how do we know if there was, in fact, the fire in the apartment, well, we can put all those rules inside the smart contract and make, it, and make it working that way. So I believe, and some of the wisest people in the world are here with me on that as well, is that if you go from industry to industry, you will find ways to optimize, to improve, to build these new kind of organizations, new kind of companies on the blockchain. In the same way, internet changed the way we communicate. The blockchain is going to redefine the notion of trust, bring this new kind of trust, trustless trust, where we, know we need no person, no institution, nobody that we need to trust for things to happen. Now the bubble. Now, I'm pretty sure some of you heard about bubble. Some of you heard about Bitcoin bubble, cryptocurrency bubble, ICO bubble. And let's take a look at the numbers. So we have 12 billions worth of dollars being raised by the blockchain startups, and it just in this year and last year. Uh, if we look at the market capitalization of the cryptocurrencies, it's over 300 billion, again, billion dollars. And we have over 1,500 cryptocurrencies. So, I'm not here to convince you there is no bubble. And there might be a bubble, there might be, no, there might be no bubble at all, but what I would like to notice is that it's not the first bubble in the history of humankind, and in fact, it's not the first bubble in IT industry. There was one, uh, there was one just about 20 years ago, and it was called dot-com bubble. And from that time, there is a saying, let's party like it's 1999, because things were so crazy back then, there was even one company that would do an IPO, would enter stock exchange, and the company was in fact just one guy in the living room on his couch. And the truth is that most of those companies, just before 2000s, uh, just before the dot-com bubble burst, they would all went bankrupt, and they would all, uh, not all of them, but most of them would go bankrupt and they would give no retirement of investments to their investors whatsoever. But there were some companies that survived. And here is some example of those. Those are companies that su barely survived dot-com bubble. For example, 
there was an article about Amazon in 2003 calling Amazon a scam, saying Amazon is not making money, it's losing money, and it's a great proof that internet business model is not sustainable and it's not a future of business whatsoever. So, assuming there is something behind blockchain, but we are in this very uncertain circumstances when we don't know if it's a bubble or not, and we know it's very early stage, how we build those companies, how we build those businesses of the future. Well, I think there is a great hint coming from one of the companies here on the slide, from Netflix. So I don't know if you know, Netflix was originally incorporated in 1997 with a simple goal to deliver movies and video content to the users over the internet. But back in 1997, the bandwidth was so low, the internet was so slow, there was no way they would stream. So instead what they did, and they did it for over 10 years, they would start sending DVDs so you can go to the internet on Thursday, fill in what you would like to watch on weekend, it would arrive on your inbox on Friday, on your old mail box, on your old school mailbox. You would, put, you would watch the movies during the weekend, you would put them back on Sunday evening and they would disappear on Monday. And they would do first DVD rental. And only 10 years later, when the internet catch up and the bandwidth was finally there, they would start streaming. And they would be one of the first to do that and they were very successful in growing their company with that. But soon they discovered that everybody would start streaming. These days, all the big companies, Apple, Google is doing streaming, HBO is doing streaming. So what they discover along the way is they have something that others don't have, which is data. And data, they would give them understanding what people want to watch, what kind of movies, with which actors, what kind of topics, even in what cities in the world this, the movies should take place. And so Netflix would become one of the most successful content producers in the world, and I'm pretty sure you know a bunch of TV series and movies produced by Netflix. So my belief is, if you want to build those companies in the future, you have to find your temporary model, something that will bring you to the next stage when the blockchain is there, when the performance of the blockchain is fine. But this will not be your end game because in a decade or so, everybody is going to do blockchain. But you're gonna find something along the way that is gonna be your competitive advantage and will let you, uh, let you move to the next stage to your final game. So, coming back to the question from the title of our presentation today. Again, I'm gonna make a comparison to internet. There was a book in 1995, it was called The Road Ahead, and the book was written by Bill Gates. And the book says, internet is going to change everything. We used to go shopping, but we will do the shopping on the internet. We used to go to schools, but we're gonna learn on the internet now. We used to watch TV or listen to the radio, we're gonna do it over the internet. And as the revolution would progress much slower than everybody expected, People would say, yeah, 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 but nothing really changed. You know, we're still doing shopping, we're still learning, we're still watching movies, but it's kind of, you know, a little bit different. So I would like to leave you with this last one thought, with this idea I would want to share with you today, is that in a decade or two, there's gonna be a little bit of blockchain somewhere in many things that you do on your daily basis. And thanks to it, it's gonna be a little bit better, a little bit more efficient, a little bit cheaper, and uh, most importantly, it's going to be a little bit more fair. Thank you. <laughs>